Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So I'm um, back with the tips for IGCSE series and this time I'll be giving you guys tips for first language English. And as you guys know, the code is 0500 and today I'll be giving you guys tips for every single uh, question on the paper. So I'll be using a past paper as an example for you guys. And the past paper that we'll be using today is 2022 February March. Okay. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. So when you take EFO in IGCSE O level, you'll be seeing two papers, paper one and paper two. And paper one is the reading paper, while the paper two is the writing paper. And that's when we put it generally. But reading paper, it actually also have writing in it. So yeah, so first one is the reading paper, which is paper one. So for that, I'll be using 050012 February, March 2022. Okay, so when you firstly go into the question, you'll see question one first. And that question one is something that I consider very easy. So most of the reading questions are just comprehension questions. So you actually don't have to worry a lot about like not getting it. So question one is just a normal comprehension question. And in here, I just want to give you guys a reminder in question 1b. So the question itself bolded the words using your own words, but students forget to you know use their own words. So I'm just um, restating this, but make sure that you use your own words when you explain what the text mean. So the question says using your own words explain what the text means by brink of extinction and vow to act so for this this type of question is actually easy if you know the synonyms that is so what it means by explain what the text mean is that you don't have to write a full language analysis of what the text mean but you just have to provide synonyms of the actual meaning so it's just making you write another meaning of the word that they give you. So in B1, it says brink of extinction. So when you're answering this question, you can actually split the phrase in two. So there's one meaning for brink off and one meaning for extinction. And you have to make sure that you wrote the whole meaning of the phrase. So you have to write both parts of the meaning. You can't just say extinction is one, everyone dies out and just leave it you know you have to write the meaning of the uh, of the whole phrase so let's look at the marking scheme so in here it actually awards two marks for full explanation and the full explanation here will be um here if it's brink of extinction they have on the edge for brink off and then dying out will be for extinction. So you have to get both parts of the phrase or else you will get only one mark. So if you want to get full marks, which is two marks, on this question, you have to write both parts of the um, text of the phrase. Okay, so this is just what um, I want to say for question one. The rest are just normal comprehension questions. You just have to read the text and then answer the questions. So this is it for question one and here, the summary question. I want to say something for the summary question. So for the summary question, it says your summary cannot be more than 120 words. So make sure that you remember the word counts. So it says 120 words. That means that your writing cannot really go over the first sheet of paper. So if you want your summary to actually look like a summary, just write your whole summary on the first sheet of paper. Don't go to the second sheet of paper because surely your handwriting cannot be that big to reach the second sheet of paper. That must just mean that you're going over the word count. So yeah, make sure you don't go over the word count and it's not just for the summary, it's for every single writing. And this comes with practice. If you do more practice, you'll know when like your word count is going to when your writing is going to go over the word count. Okay, so and another thing is to keep it as concise as possible. You're writing a summary and not an article or anything. 
So summary means that it wants you to have only the information that is necessary and you don't have to include the details. So in this type of summary question, they actually ask you only one question, like only one aspect of the whole text. So in here it says, what should we find concerning about tigers being kept in captivity? So when you're writing, you just have to focus on this part of the text and only find the information about this part. Actually, the text will be probably giving you about why the tigers got captured, since when did uh, tigers start to get, got, um, get captured. So yeah, so you just have to write about why it's concerning that tigers are being captured. So you only need to include that information and not any other information. And that means that your summary does not need any intro or the outro. So you don't need any introduction or the conclusion. Just go straight to the point and answer the question. And that way you'll get the full 15 marks that the question will give you. Okay, so you approximately should probably spend about um, 20 minutes on this question and don't really go over 20 minutes. Okay, so for the approach to this type of question, I suggest you to read the question first and after that go to the text, read it again and find the necessary information, highlight them or annotate them if possible and then use them, reorder them and use them in your summary. And yeah, don't include any details, just include the important points. And one thing that students usually find it hard when, you're, when they're writing summary is that they find it hard to paraphrase the words that are in the text. For me, when I read the text, the words in the text got sort of stuck in my head and I keep using the words in the text in my own summary. But that's not okay because it says use your own words, right? So you have to sort of know the synonyms of the words that are given in the text and even if you don't know synonyms, make sure that you change the grammatical structure or the sentence structure so that it doesn't look like you directly copied it from your text. And another thing is you can also change the order of ideas from the original text. It doesn't have to follow the same chronological order of the text. Okay, and aim to add about 10 points in the summary. Okay, so that's all I have for the summary writing. And now let's move on to the language analysis. So actually these um, question two, the stops in question two is almost the same as question one. So I won't be going into details. Now what I'll be going into is this one. So in text two C, it starts with the language analysis. So this is when your actual writing begins. I'll just tell you the structure of language analysis. So how a language analysis should be is that you should have a quote. So in this question, it says, use one example from the text below to explain how the writer suggests his feelings as he learns to track tigers. So in this question, it says one example, so you only need one quote, not more than one quote and explain how the writer suggests his feelings as he learns to track tigers. So you have to select a quote that would, exp uh, that would explain the writer's feelings when he starts to learn how to track tigers. So yeah, you have to firstly select the correct quote. So the quote should uh, depict a strong image and the quote that you chose should align with the marking scheme or else you won't get any marks. So yeah, you just have to choose the quote that you're 100% sure that would be in the marking scheme. So this is actually a very um, crucial point because if you selected the wrong quote, even if you write, wrote like a very, very great language analysis of the quote that you choose, you won't get any marks if the quote that you chose is not in the marking scheme. Yeah, so firstly choose a quote and then 
um, tell the meaning of the quote. So what I mean by this is you just have to say the literal meaning of what the quote means. So yeah, this is the explanation. So the meaning should be written in the text explicitly. So you just have to explain the explicit meaning of what the quote that you chose means. Okay. So another thing is the inference or the connotation, whatever you want. So what I mean is you have to write about what you associate with the word and what it makes you think. So what I mean by this is, let's say that we chose this thing called a black quote, uh, a black fog as our quote. So black means something dark, something sinister, something bad is about to happen. It looks like a bad omen, right? So that's the thing that we associate with the color black. So we call that inference or the connotation. And if we select fog, a black fog, right? Black means something evil, something sinister. And fog also means something bad. So that means that they use double negative or something. You can explain something like that. So yeah, you explain the inference and the connotation. And next and lastly, you will explain the effect it has on our on the reader. So if we chose the black fog, it will have an effect of like on the reader that something unsettling might be going on, something bad is going to happen, something like that. You just have to explain the effect that the phrase have on the reader. So this is basically how a language analysis structure looks. Quote, meaning, and connotation, and then effect. So just use those four um, bullet points and make sure to structure it well when you're writing a language analysis. And personally, I like to add um, a language device. Like if they're using simile, I will say that they're using simile. If it's a metaphor, I'll say that it's a metaphor. You don't really have to add what the language uh, what language device the writer is using, but I personally prefer writing about it because it makes my uh, writing sounds clever, but you don't have to do it. Okay, so that's about language analysis. So another thing that comes after the language analysis, oh yeah, this one is also language analysis. So what I just said is those two combined. This one is the larger version and the actual thing that we have to write. So now let's move on to question three, which is extended response. So I'm gonna be looking at my phone. Okay, so for question three, extended response, we actually have different types of writings that we have to write here. So you'll actually be asked to write either a letter a speech, an interview, a newspaper report, a magazine article, or a journal. So one of these, you'll have to write one of these. So yeah, you actually have to know how to write all of these. So the total marks that it give is 25 marks and you'll have to spend around 40 minutes on the question, 10 minutes on planning, and 30 minutes on actually writing it. So first tip that I have to give you guys that you have to make sure to have a solid plan before writing yeah, or before writing extended response because if you don't have a solid plan, you'll just be sort of like writing something but you don't know which direction your writing is going. So you actually don't have a point that you're trying to say to the examiner. So that just makes it harder to actually write about so yeah, make sure that you have a solid plan before writing. And another downside of not having a plan is that not like, yeah, you won't know which direction you're going, but worse is that you will probably be trying to like delete paragraphs and paragraphs and delete some words here and there, and your writing will look very messy to the examiner. And that will leave a bad impression on the examiner. Not that we care about impressions, but yeah, you should care about um, impressions when you're doing EFL because your marks lies in the palm of your examiner. 
So yeah, make sure to write your questions and answer your questions very neatly too, especially for EFO. Okay, so another tip that I have is not to hesitate in order to like annotate on the paper. So simply put, make sure you annotate on the paper and highlight stuff that you think is important because that is very, very great in when you're trying to plan for something. So, okay, another thing is to write everything that the question asks you to write. Normally, the question have three bullet points and in here too. So it have three bullet points and usually the last bullet point is something that it's not explicit, so something that we have to think by ourselves. And what I want to remind you is that you have to make sure that you write about each bullet point equally. So like, don't try doing something like you saw the first bullet point and you read the text, right? And you actually saw lots of stuff to write about the first bullet point. So you spent about like half of your time and trying to write about like one um big paragraph that consists about like 15 lines about one bullet point about the first bullet point and in the second bullet point you spend the same amount of bullet point and in, when you come to the last bullet point you actually don't have the time nor the energy to write and think and plan again so you actually just wrote like five lines for that one so that is a big difference in the a number of like lines that you spent on each bullet point and yeah you can't do that so you have to spend equally on each bullet point like spend a, an equal amount of time on each bullet point and also an equal amount of writing on each bullet point and you can actually do the paragraphing like this you can write one paragraph for each bullet point and you'll end up with three paragraphs and you can have an introduction paragraph and the conclusion paragraph. So five paragraphs in total. And here I also want to suggest you to not just state the explicit points, but also try to develop the points that you have chosen and make um, some implications about them. And you actually get marks for developing the ideas that is explicitly stated in the text and again, I'll remind you to not go over the word count and to not copy exact words from the text, use your own words. So how I study to answer this type of question is that I would learn the structure for each type of writing. So basically, I would try to learn how to write each type of writing. And for this, I recommend watching videos on YouTube especially this YouTube channel called IGCSE Success. And they ha he have like very useful videos about how to answer each type of question. And I usually try to learn the videos, like try to watch the videos before actually trying to write something. And I actually joined their Discord channel too. And the members there actually give you feedback on the writing that you've done. And you can actually read other people's writings as well. So I think that this is very beneficial for anyone who's trying to write something. So yeah, make sure to join their Discord channel too. And actually, I mostly practiced writings instead of the reading questions because I find reading easier than writing definitely because it's just mostly comprehension questions. So I practice more for the writing part and I have an English teacher, so I try to submit my writings to my English teacher and then receive the feedback from her. And sometimes I would make my close friends that also take EFO and I would make them give feedback to my writing and, you know, find what to, which part to improve on. And I actually love reading other people's writings too and they give me inspiration. So make sure if you have friends, just read their writings because you'll definitely learn some new vocabularies and interesting choices of words and interesting language structures, sentence structures. These are some things that I did for EFO and these are how I actually studied for EFO. So let's move on to paper two. Paper two is actually directed writing and composition. 
So directed writing is the same as extended response. It's nearly the same. So I won't go much into this, but I will be going on to composition. So composition is my favorite part of EFO and this is what actually keeps me alive from writing a lot. Yeah, this is my last thread. So yeah, for composition, firstly, when you're writing composition, they'll give you like four prompts. And I just want to suggest you to actually pick the topic that interests you. So it'll ask you to write either descriptive writing or narrative writing. And I suggest you not to just focus on practicing for one type of writing because just don't focus on like, let's say that you chose descriptive writing and you're going to only choose descriptive writing in your finals too. And it's the same for narrative writing. And I don't actually suggest you to do that because personally for me, I like to learn both narrative and descriptive because you actually don't know which title that they give you will actually spark something in you. So what I mean that is that um, even if it's like descriptive or narrative, I don't look if it's descriptive or narrative first. I would firstly look whether the topic that they give me is actually interesting because I need the drive to start writing something. I need to only write the thing that I like or else nothing comes out of my mind. So if we're looking at this question, I would actually choose this thing called describe a street which has changed over time. And I wouldn't choose others. And why, why is that? I actually love using the themes of nostalgia and you know, sentimental themes. And I love to focus my writings around those themes. So I sort of tend to reuse the same elements in my composition. So when I actually choose something, I would choose a title that has something to do with those themes. And that is this thing called Describe Tree, which has changed over time. Because I definitely love write, like watching a lot of K-dramas and I love how, like I love the vintage and sort of nostalgic feelings of high school, youth, romance and old stuff, like something like that. I like using those in my writings. So I would just write something that have the, that have to do with the themes that I usually write. So I don't care if it's descriptive or narrative. So yeah, this is my personal advice that I have. And another thing is that when you're writing compositions, your compositions need to be authentic or else the examiner won't really give you marks. So what I mean that you can actually take inspirations from like the K-drama, the novel or the anime that you just watched, but you cannot copy everything. You can take inspiration from some parts of it. You can reuse the settings that they you, they've used in and no one would notice a thing, but you can't just follow the exact plot from the K-drama that you just watched and write it again. So this is what I mean by needing to be authentic. And another suggestion is to read other people's writing so that you can learn new writing styles and more ways to use your words. And read novels because they help with both narrative and descriptive writings. So I remember when I had a um, EFO test during my for my school. It's a school test. And I actually just read a novel called uh, If You Can See The Sun, I think. It's actually a romance sci-fi, no, romance fantasy, so that kind of book. And I actually only did that. And they, it was very useful because it was describing like a scene when the girl stepped into an auditorium and the noises were so loud, right? And it had a word that I particularly liked. It was this thing called the noises reached a crescendo. And I love the use of the words there. So I would just remember it in my head and I reused it in my descriptive or narrative composition that I was going to write. So this is what I mean by taking inspirations from the novel that you've just read. So write down the words and phrases that you find interesting and reuse them when you're writing your own writing. So these help a lot. So make sure that you read a lot, read other people's writings, try to get feedback for your own writing. 
and just overall practice a lot for writing. You don't have to worry a lot about reading, but do practice a lot for the writing part because it just helps you know when, like which part of the thing that you might need to improve and just make sure that you read your writings like before you go into the final exam too. Oh, this is another tip that I just remember right now. So like if you're writing something, write them on your Google Doc and then compile all of them in one file. And when you're going to go into the exam room, read all of the stuff that you've written and they actually help a lot. So yeah, this is a before you step into the exam room sort of tip, but you can use that, yeah. Okay, this is all I have for English as a first language and I hope you guys found it helpful. And yeah, I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.